The year was 1919 and the place was Amritsar's Jallianwala Bagh where thousands of men, women and children had gathered to celebrate the Sikh festival of Baisakhi and to demonstrate against the draconian British laws. But General Renegal Dyer had different plans altogether for Indians. In his words, he wanted to teach them a lesson for having defied prohibitory orders. Hence, he ordered his troops to open fire on a peaceful congregation, killing hundreds and injuring thousands of others. Michael O'Dyer, the then Lieutenant Governor of Punjab, endorsed General Dyer's actions and supported him enthusiastically. But do you know there was an Indian who avenged those killings 21 years later? Today on this episode of Outlook Bibliophile, through the book The Patient Assassin, authored by British broadcaster and journalist Anita Anand, we are going to revisit the story of this Indian who we know very little about. Anita Anand, thank you so much for speaking to Outlook magazine. Uh, I was just recording the, recording the introduction to this um, episode and I decided purposely not to mention the name of the, the patient assassin. Oh, cool. So, uh, we were wondering if you could just explain who this patient assassin was and why does India know very little about him? That's, a, that's, really, that's an exciting thing to do. So, um, so, who is Udham Singh? It's such a good question because to the British at the time, he was one of the most dangerous people who threatened to destabilize the country at a time of war. So he was enemy number one. Um, to the point where they recreated his image to discredit him and turned him into a lone wolf lunatic. And because they had all the power and they had all the records and they were in charge and it was World War II going on, that is the only message that got out and reached India also. So that was the message that Gandhi and Nehru and others propagated, that he was a nutter who did a terrible thing and did not help India's cause. However, even the Indian National Youth Congress didn't believe it and they turned him into a hero. In fact, they turned him into the hero that you see now hanging in rooms still in Punjab. You know, the avenging angel, the man who sprung up covered in the blood of Jallianwala Bagh, the man who uh, dedicated his life and hunted down, and if you look at some of the pages on the internet, Dyer and O'Dwyer. I mean, you know, the one who killed Michael Dyer or Reginald O'Dwyer. You know, the story has become so conflated and so mm -hmm. messy. The truth is in between those things and the truth is more extraordinary than any of these two confected stories. You just, you just talked about how Gandhi reacted to Singh's act. Um, he defined in your book, you write it as an act of insanity. Was it, was it because of the inconvenience that it caused to the narrative of India's peaceful uh, uh, independence movement driven by, largely driven by the, the, the message of Gandhi of non-violence. So it was largely that. Yeah. It was largely because it was, it was seen that there were bigger fish to fry in this game. And that Jallianwala Bagh, as deplorable as it was, as awful as it was, uh, Udham Singh's reasoning as to why he had done this, that was all unimportant compared to the bigger picture, which was emancipation of India. And so Nehru and Gandhi at that time were at pains to, to tell the British, look, we are not savages, we are not natives, we are capable of running our own affairs, there will not be a bloodbath. And then this inconvenient truth of a man who brazenly walks into, not just anywhere, Westminster, in the shadow of the mother of all parliaments, at a time when Britain is feeling most vulnerable, where Hitler's forces are making uh, great pushes into, into territory that they should not be in. Here is this man who makes Britain look weak. And so it's almost this uh, a, a sort of a dance of the devil, if you like. The British want to paint him as a lunatic because they don't want to look weak, that this is a man who, you know, he's, a, he's a man who got lucky rather than a man who planned his way in. So they start weaving and confecting this story. And, and in the book, I, I found lots of documents that show them doing it. Mm. You know, that we must do this. We must paint it this way. We must get Reuters not to report what mm. he says. You know, this, this, this horrible uh, a, a allegiance of rewriting a man's story. And in India, there is not one finger raised by the Congress the leadership to do anything for him or to say anything on his behalf because it doesn't suit them either. Mm -hmm. You know, because he is doing the savagery that mm -hmm. they're trying to say we don't do mm -hmm. here. And so they, they repudiate him as a nutcase. In between, even then, in 1940, even then, there are people in the Indian youth movement of Congress who said, no, this is, man is a hero. This man has done what we have all wanted to do, which is punish these people who slaughtered our, our people like animals that day in April. So, you know, there's a, there is this whole strange 
real politique going on around a man who is sitting in jail, who knows he's going to die, and who for a little while doesn't know was it worth it or not, and why has everyone forgotten? You know, that thing that Christ does on the cross, Eli, Eli, nama tabachni, why have you forsaken me? He's saying this to himself, you know, why did I do this? Little does he know that there are people all around who do believe in him, and who will take his memory forward, which they do. Before we delve more into um, uh, life and times of uh, Udham Singh, I want to ask you what exactly did the impact of the massacre have on India's independence movement? Basically, the massacre happened in 1919. Mm. Did it, in a way, gave motivated rather the independence movement you know it, it gave a fresh stimulus to it did it did that happen? it did you know there, there there was a saying at the time and and it uh, it rumbled around Westminster and you know British echelons of power that a thousand martyrs have been born this day they knew in Britain how heinous this thing was and how it would inflame and enrage Indians to dedicate themselves to the overthrow of the British who you know they knew the British knew they were vastly outnumbered by Indians and if the Indians chose to rise up as one they were out they knew that um, but also what it did was it made certain people in power in Britain doubt and question the thing that they had been fed with their mother's milk that Britain had a right to rule that Britain had moral superiority that the British were better than these natives and needed the you know sort of paternalism of the the, the great white savior to yeah. come, because you know they had s shown themselves to be savage, mm. to act like a sa savages, and it wasn't really just the massacre. You know, people to have, have particularly last year at the anniversary, it started driving me a little bit mad that people started talking about the massacre as if it was something in isolation. Mm. And I write about this a lot in the book. It was not one monstrous act, as Churchill very famously said. It was symptomatic of a yeah. whole campaign of terror that took place after yeah. the massacre. Yeah. So yes, it was a watershed moment because it gave rocket fuel mm. to the Quit India movement or those people who wanted in, in the British out. And also it started making people like the Secretary of State for India, Samuel Montague, like others who debated in the House of Lords, who are we? What are we? What are we doing there? Uh, question themselves and that altogether you know history doesn't turn on one pin but a pin can puncture slow puncture a balloon and I think that's what happened it just really hastened the end of the Raj. Coming back to Singh I want to read uh, something from the book uh, you write uh, Singh took a handful of blood soaked earth in his hand and he swore a terrible vow no matter how long it took no matter how far it took him he would track down the dogs who did this to his people and kill them. Uh, do you know there's a film that came in 2002, a Bollywood film, it, it was called The Legend of Bhagat Singh. Mm -hmm. there, is, there is a character depicted in exactly the same mm -hmm. way. <laughs> yeah. And there's no firm evidence of uh, no. Odham Singh's presence at no. this spot. Do you want to shed some more light on it? So it, 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 it's absolutely true. So that part of the book I've written in italics, italics absolutely. because it is the thing that is said yeah. over yeah. and over again. And if you go to Johnny Malabar yeah. now, today, you will see a statue of Udham Singh with his hand out here yeah. holding the clod of blood-soaked mm. earth. You cannot prove that he said mm. it. The British, however, tried very, very hard. And, and, and what saddens me is that India took this British line, hook, line and sinker for so many years without questioning it. They took this idea that he was a madman. They took this idea he was a lone wolf. They took this idea that he got lucky and he stumbled into Caxton Hall when he did. And they also took this notion that he wasn't even there because the British wanted to separate him mm -hmm. from Jalia Malabar. Yeah. The reason, why did they want to do it so much? They had Indian soldiers fighting for them in World War II. They were stretched paper thin mm. to fight the Nazis. So if anything happened in India at this time, you know, if people were reminded of Jalia Malabar and the absolute horror of that and, and how that actually defined what colonialism was in many ways to many people that would destroy them mm. so instead you know they they try very very hard and they have access to all records to prove he wasn't there or to prove he wasn't in the country to you know what they couldn't the only thing they could say in all of these records is we cannot say definitively if he was there so if they couldn't say it at the time and they were really trying to say he wasn't there nobody can say he was not there 
you know, none of the, even the military records that I looked at, some historians have said, oh, he was serving in Mesopotamia or he was serving in Europe. That's not there. Or he was in Waziristan, somebody said. That is not there. They couldn't say it. They didn't say it at the time. But neither can I say mm. that he said those words. So I put those things in context. You you know, this yeah. is what they say. Yeah. This is what I have found. Because I, I try to be an honest broker yeah. in this. Because uh, I just think you can tell the story and leave the space because what is not in doubt yeah. is the massacre defined the rest of this man's life. Absolutely. And that he was obsessed, he was patient, he did what most human beings could never do, which is sacrifice all happiness, all chance of a family, all chance of a life, because he made this promise, which he then carries out in the most dramatic operatic fashion. It's extraordinary what he did. There's also there's also um, you know a lot of confusion over General Dyer and Michael mm -hmm. Dyer, right? You know people yeah. actually conflate the two names. Well, I was sort of saying that yeah. you know when you go yeah. on the internet and yeah. you see what is it about with them saying he killed uh, Brigadier General O'Dwyer, Michael o Dyer. I mean it it has become this composite raksha, I sort of say Absolutely. in the book. Yeah. 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 They were two very different people. Yeah. So if you could if you could just you know distinguish between the two for sure. our uh, for our viewers because uh, O'Dyer who was basically killed. Uh, or gunned down by Singh yeah. was the was the then Lieutenant Governor of Punjab That's who right. endorsed General Dyer's actions. Who endorsed and arguably created a situation whereby this would happen. Mm. It was only a matter of time was it going to happen in Jallianwalabagh or somewhere else. But this was a man who utterly believed that mutiny was on the horizon and he was the man to stop it. He was the man who was going to save the Raj. And was was re had, a, had a visceral dislike of Indians. <laughs> it didn't like, he well, loved being an Indian. I suppose that wasn't very different from all the <laughs> other British officials. Yeah, no, because Dyer, mm. Brigadier General Dyer, loved Indians. Oh. He had Indians adored him. You know, he was the Brigadier General. If anyone's watched the film Gandhi, yeah. it is the character of Edward Fox who drives his vehicles to the entrance, can't get them in, and his view, all of that is true. It wasn't Edward Fox, but Dyer could not get his vehicles in. And he would have used the machine guns on them if he could have done, you know. But he is also a man who had the utter loyalty of his Indian troops. They loved him. Mm. He spoke Hindi fluently. He was happier in India. India was his country. He identified himself as Indian when he was sent back in disgrace after the massacre. He was made the scapegoat for the whole yeah. thing. He died. He, yeah. he slowly, you saw this man implode because he was out of his country that he loved. Mm. You know, so it's this very weird thing. So. I try in the book because, you know, all my life, and, and one thing I haven't admitted to is I have a personal connection. Hmm. My grandfather was in the yeah. garden on the day of the massacre. So it's a very, and I've been raised to fear those names, mm -hmm. Dyer Edwire. So to have to unpick that fear and say, no, 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 we're not going to talk about this Rakshas, hmm. but there are two men here who were once two boys, who were once had two lives. What makes a person capable of doing this? And that's what I hoped to have done. And what I found was you had one man, Dyer, who was the Brigadier General, mm. who is consumed by doubt and dies a horrible death of natural causes. Mm. And Michael O'Dwyer, the Lieutenant Governor, who proudly says he did the right thing, the massacre was important, it saved the Raj and he never lost a night's sleep in his life about mm. it, who is then gunned down and dies in Westminster in a pool of his own blood like so many of those people died in Jenny yeah. You know, the symmetry, if I presented it to a fiction editor, they'd say, go away and write something more convincing. Mm -hmm. This is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But it's true. It's true, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Singh's uh, um, trial, if correct me if I'm wrong, lasted two days. Two days. Uh, did he say anything in his defense? He's, he rambled away. And he rambled uh, all sorts of uh, kind of strange things at the police station. He said one thing on the scene of the crime, because we have those contemporaneous notes taken by the police officer, I have seen the book in which he wrote, I have seen the way in which he, things are crossed out. So, you know, you, you see those things. And in the court, he pretty much withdrew, except just to mess things about a bit, because what he was trying to do was string out the case as much as he could cause maybe a plea of insanity just to wait out what his conviction was was that if the germans win the war they'll set me free mm. so i could there could be a long wait to the noose what he didn't realize is that they were fast tracking that man to execution so he had no hope so by the time the trial comes around he's pretty much not interested in it he speaks at the end though when he's given that death sentence so when he knows or he's found guilty 
he does this extraordinary speech which we only know about because Special Branch took notes. The media never reported it because they were not allowed to report it and they were all complicit. Reuters was utterly complicit, shameful actually, in not reporting anything that he said. And his notes that he wrote were ripped up and thrown into the air, which the, the police then glued together. And you can see those in archives still. And that is a, a fiery call upon Indians to unite and overthrow the British. He calls to Gandhi that you need to do this, you need to be our saviour, you know, directly to Gandhi. He calls the British dirty dogs and worse. And it is, a, it is a, an explosion of rage. And we also know that he spat at the court as he was led out. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as he's out of view, what happened in the courts in those days is the judge puts on, takes out a piece of black silk, puts it on his wig and says, this man is going to hang. And it is boom, beginning to end very, very quick and very fast. I saw the plot of land they threw his body into around the back of Pentonville prison. I, I walked near it. It is, a, it is the most miserable little scrubby bit of land where prisoners were thrown in. Uh, and because there was such a small space but so many people were hanged <laughs> over the years, they used to bury them not side by side but one on top of each oh. other. And the only way you knew where one ended and one began was they would sprinkle lime and chalk over oh. the top. So if anyone's burying, you know, they dig until they reach the line of chalk because you don't want to go through the next body. He was thrown in there and he and they, the British, must have thought he would be forgotten forever. Well, hopefully not the yeah. case. Uh, well, uh, Ms. Anand, thank you so much for speaking to oh, Outlook. This so makes for, uh, for a fascinating read because oh. I've, I've, I've read uh, about 70% of it already, but I've gone through the reviews, so I know a fair bit of okay. how it ends. I just blew the ending <laughs> for you. <laughs> yeah. But uh, thank you so much again. Oh, it, was, uh, it was absolutely oh, no, really lovely to meet. pleasure, thank you pleasure very much. talking to you. Thank you.